Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Naraja Stuma. I'm the Associate Director of the Cancer Care Equity Program, as well as a thoracic oncologist at the Dana Farber Cancer Institute and an Assistant Professor at Harvard Medical School. Today, I had the pleasure to talk to you about embracing the power of being real and how you are perfect the way you are. These are my disclosures. I have advisor and consultant disclosures with several companies, as well as speaking engagements with several CME groups. So before we move, I, I wanna tell a story because I think the power of storytelling is very strong. And I hope you will remember some of this story. So I'm a four generation doctor and I moved to this country uh, to do some of my clinical rotations from medical school. Back home, I was one of many, but I remember landing in this country and being labeled quickly about some stereotypes that associated with my ethnicity. I'm a Latina, I self-identify as a Latina, Spanish is my first language. So I remember being a stereotype as spicy, loud, uh, colorful, um, right as long as I landed. And I was quite different in, um, particularly in medicine when there's not many people around me or around us that look or share our cultural um, beliefs or, or cultural behaviors, it can feel like you need to fit in in this box. And the problem with fitting it in in that box is that the box was created from people that are not like me. They were created for the majority group. And in many cases, it was created to fit men better than women. So you often feel like you don't belong because all those standards that have been created um, were based on what the majority group was before. Now we over 51% of women being in medical schools in the United States, we need to make sure we teach and that we embrace ourselves because as a way of role modeling our medical students and trainees, we understand and see that it's okay to be. So I came to this country and my English was poor. I was already in my twenties learning English. And I remember waiting outside of the Starbucks um, trying to find the bravery to go on front and ask for my coffee of choice. I'm South American, I have been drinking coffee since I'm two years old. But that language barrier, that different environment took all my confidence away, despite being a very confident woman back home. And this can happen when you enter medical school, when you enter a residency program, when you become faculty for the first time, and which you may be the only woman or you may be the only minority. And in many cases, you may be it. So as I came to the United States and I was a resident, I'm showing you this picture of me as a resident. Um, this is a second year resident at the CCU um, in my residency program. From the outside, it really looked like I was thriving, right? I was publishing more than any other resident. I was, um, during my second year of residency, I received an award by the Department of Medicine as a most as quarterly resident, means the resident doing more research. And I was called what, what people name as a rising star, but they didn't know that I was struggling to fit in. I remember receiving comments like, you are so Latina, or you're too colorful. Um, coming from uh, the Caribbean, where I trained for medical school, we often wear very colorful clothes because you don't wear black when it is 100 degrees outside and 100% humidity. But all those comments made me feel like I didn't belong. Despite being a four generation doctor, despite growing in the vacuum, when my mom as a single mother surgeon relieved me um, to be taken care of by the nurses when she was going in the OR. So all those microaggressions and those comments made me feel like maybe it was not okay to be me. So I kept hitting pieces of my personality in order to fit in. I have very different experiences compared to my classmates. Like I grew up in a developing country we had trouble economy, a trouble political situation. So I we often refrain from sharing my stories because nobody understood them. And as I move up in my career, 
it became less and less common to have women around. And if you talk about Latino women, we're only 1.8% of physicians in the US. So if you find two Latino women in one room, you may buy a lottery ticket that day. So all that led to clinical depression during residency. I remember getting into my car, I started crying in my car and I would get home, my commute was 40 minutes, still crying. We jump in the shower and then I would fall asleep just exhausted. Hope earrings are no professional. Long earrings are no professional. This color is professional, this color is not. And all the standards are based on no data and honestly, who decided what is professional and what is not. If it's part of my culture, how you would call something that's part of my culture unprofessional. One example of that is hoop earrings. In Latin America and Africa, and some tribes, particularly in South America, the size of the hoop earring is associated with the role of the woman in the tribe. Let the larger their hoop, the higher the ranking. So when I'm told that those earrings are not professional, makes me feel and makes feel other people like being who you are and embracing your culture is not professional. So after that in residency, all those comments about, oh, you're so colorful, you're so Latina, which I still don't know what you're so Latina means, led to completely changing my wardrobe, my way of being, just trying to fit in. Why I'm being clinically depressed. All my wardrobe changed to blue, dark, black, gray. I slowly saw in two years how I was just trying to fit in and what makes me unique was hidden in a box just because I wanted it to fit in, just because one of the things I share were considered no professional. And these things are saying it's not me wearing a leather skirt, which also can be okay, but a colorful shirt that shows my culture. So after those years of training, I felt like my white coat didn't fit, that I was putting on this costume to go and work. The work we do is emotionally and physically hard especially if you're in residency. So on top of that, if you feel like you don't belong and that there is no a role or there is no a space for you as a whole, that makes the whole training more difficult. And I have learned over, year, over the years that I wasn't the only one in my program or in general to feel like this. So the, the goal today to talk is besides sharing my personal story, is to reflect in what we call professional, how professionalism has been used against women and minorities, and how are we losing the beauty of diversity by trying to fit in everyone in a box. I tell people the example of a potluck. You want a potluck with diversity. You don't want everybody to bring mac and cheese. You, see, you want other stuff. So in residency, I have all the awards, traveled to many countries, presented at national and international conference for my research. And the ironic part is that the leadership thought I was thriving, that I was the example, the research resident, when in fact, I was clinically depressed. A little bit about my story, I shared it at the ASCO Voices in 2021. So the ASCO Voices are like in a format of a tech talk in which person, a person shares their story. I wanna invite you all to like hear the entire presentation about you know residency and trying to fit in. The link is here at the presentation and compared to other presentations at the ASCO annual meeting, the ASCO Voices is open to everyone. So even if you did not attend the meeting, you still can hear the presentations. And the presentations, not, not only my presentation, but the presentations of my colleagues that years and colleagues before. Because as oncologists and physicians, they're a humanistic part of us. 
we are more than our job. Yes, our job is a very important part of our lives, but we are more than that. As a consequence of this talk, it brought attention to many platforms, including Medscape, about how we may actually, in an unconscious way, discourage our trainees or our colleagues to be who they truly are. It takes effort and energy to be somebody who you're not, or hiding key pieces of your personality. I was exhausted. When you are second guessing everything you say, when you don't say anything at the table because you're afraid you will be judged because your experiences are different to others. But then, as we know by Dr. Karn's research, if we stay quiet as a woman, we don't get recognized. And then if we talk as a woman, then we get stereotyped as an alpha female. But the summary of my story is that one day I woke up and I was just exhausted trying to be somebody else. And I remember I was already in fellowship looking for in the closet for one dress that I still haven't thrown away. And it was a yellow dress. And that's with this, this is why um, this highlight of Medscape says, onto she put on a yellow dress. That was the last piece of colorful clothing I have kept um, from the original time when I moved to this country. I was just tired. And I hope that, you know, the next generation of doctors don't have the same experience as I do. Because you want your doctors to be in a better mindset. So I put on that yellow dress and I knew I have something to bring to the table, which was my unique experience as a Latina in medicine and my unique experience as a daughter and a granddaughter of Latinas. And that led to more success that I had when I was trying to fit in. And a vision that I'm here to help others that may be or may go on, going to be in a similar situation to mine, to create an environment in which everyone is welcome, not only minorities, racial or ethnic minorities, but also members of the LGBTQI community, older adults that may be in medical school or patients, also trainees that come from no socioeconomic status that they don't have the privilege I have which is coming for a multi-generational doctor family. That moment in which you realized I needed to wear that yellow dress was the moment when I knew that my vision and my goal was to create safe environments for everyone in oncology and outside oncology. One of the results of this is, as I say, Latinas are only 1.8% of the um, physician workforce in the United States. So isolation is very common for Latinas in medicine. First, we are follow microaggressions. The stereotypes for Latinas, which they're present for everyone, are very marked. I remember being rounding in the hospital wearing a black suit with my stethoscope and uh, I, my ID that says doctor and still be asked by a patient's family to come and clean the room because which it is a very important job in the hospital to be part of janitorial services, that is the stereotype that a large percentage of Latinos are in janitorial services. Being confused as a social worker, being confused as the nurse. And ironically, this morning when I was taking a car share services to my office and the guy is dropping me at the hospital, for the first time he asked me, are you a physician? Because I often ask, are you a nurse? Are you a tech? Are you a translator? Are you a social worker? And I think embracing yourself and creating groups like this are changing how we see doctors. We need to get rid of those signs in which there's a bunch of white men because then we are reinforcing the stereotypes that only that group can be doctors. So as I came out of the depression and I started embracing who I was, we found it in conjunction with uh, student Dr. Christophers and Dr. Maria Mora Pinzon, the Latinas in Medicine Twitter community. Now the community has over 6,000 members. We have interviews in which we showcase um, Latinas to amplify their stories. 
We have served as a place in which Latinas can connect, and you can see this at the bottom of the screen, in which these two Latinas met at the PMNR conference. Before it used to be one, now there's two. We created these ribbons that people we put in their badges to identify each other. Because Latinos, we come in every different flavor and size and color. So instead of guessing if somebody is Latino, you can see their badges. Unfortunately, that has gone away due to the pandemic, but we hope to bring it back. The Latinas in Medicine group now has a research grant. So this is how embracing yourself, how finding that diversity is beauty, can also be related to research. So we founded, we co-founded the Latinas in Medicine group. Now we have a research grant that's trying to understand the Latinas in Medicine experience. This is different to other studies because the majority of the studies that evaluate minority experience in medical school or medical training are composed of a large majority of Black or African-American. But this is very limited data about Latinas and I think it's in part due to the small sample. So we're hoping in the next year to launch this study to really understand the opportunities and the challenges that Latinas in medicine face. A very understudied group and a very underappreciated group. Currently, 18% of the US population self-identify as Latinx or Hispanic. And by 2030, which is nine years from now, Hispanics are gonna be the minority majority, meaning we're gonna be the largest group of all minority patients. We are not even close to be there for Latina physicians. We're 30, 40 years behind. So organizations like Latinas in Medicine helps with the sense of isolation, amplifies their achievement, and also helps Latinas find role models, which can be very hard sometimes because we are not many. But when I was finally able to embrace who I am and tell the stories I need to tell, success follow as well as personal fulfillment. And there is no dream too big. So last year, Dr. Gladys Rodriguez and I presented to ASCO, which is the largest um, oncology society in the United States, about having a Conquer Cancer Foundation Joint Investigator Award dedicated to Latinas in medicine. Latinas in oncology are also very underrepresented. And one of the things that we see is that a lot of Latinas go to private practice. Maybe they don't feel like they're in a welcome environment, Maybe there are other factors, no enough funding, no enough sponsorship, no enough mentorship. So we conducted gra grassroots fundraising, Dr. Rodriguez and I, emailing friends, calling people in order to fund the first Latinas in Medicine Joint Investigator Award. And I'm delighted to share with you that we were able to collect the money. The first Latina in Medicine Joint Investigator Award has been awarded to a resident um, a radiation oncology resident at, um, you know, at Jefferson. And we're gonna continue to raise funds every year. And I hope to come to some of you um, because we need to prevent or at least help the exodus of Latinas um, out of academic oncology. So as we develop the, um, the Latinas in medicine, we created this poster. We, uh, about the statistics of the site. We have over 3,000 tweets, 44,000 favorites, excuse me. We identify tweets um, and everyone who's associated with healthcare profession is welcome. Um, and we increase the visibility of many Latinas. I think the hashtag strategy that we use was to have a central point, create a mutual benefit embrace and synchrony, and most importantly, get noticed. You can fully read the paper about how the Latinas in Medicine Twitter community was developed, it continues to thrive, and this article, the Journal of Grad Graduate Medical Education. Another thing that I think embracing yourself is great opportunities for mentorship. I'm very fortunate to have great mentees Many of them are from underrepresented groups in medicine. And together, we have developed projects to embrace uniqueness. 
or to mention uh, inequalities. With Dr. Patel, formerly at Mayo Clinic, currently a fellow at Stanford, we realized that women were not getting enough, um, they were disproportionately less represented in um, oncology awards. Grand developments and embracing yourself is doing the things that matter to you. It's not only about wearing makeup and wearing an eyeliner, it's about doing the projects that you, the science that you care about. Because sometimes we are told you should like this, you should be a clinical trialist. And the things that we like may be undermined. So in my career, in order to embrace myself, I realized that I was in a phase one trialist, but a cancer health disparities researcher, or a social uh, justice scientist, like I was once called. And, and I think it has a good ring to it. So the social justice scientist. So mentorship is in a wishing you can be a role model when you're confident and you know you have a place in medicine. So these young women are doing remarkable. And it's my true honor to serve as their role model and mentor. As a result of all of this, we needed to create an environment that was um, friendly to everyone, that people could be the true self when working with this team. This is not an updated um, picture of the Duma Lab. Now we are up to 33 members, which includes core members and senior faculty advisors. But the point is that we all have one goal, and it's to improve the care of patients with lung cancer, as well as medical education, and you know, decrease discrimination in medicine and medical education. The Duma Lab is the true example of embracing yourself, or embracing myself. Creating a community in which it was okay to be who you are. Duma Lab now is two years old. We have nine abstracts submitted to ASCO. And in early July, we launched a campaign, we are a coffee mug. Um, and it was very well received all around the nation. If you can see at the top of the screen, we have student doctor Gabriela Geiger. She has been part of our team for two years. And a few weeks ago, she texted me, she's like, I will never have wore hoops to medical school. But because of you, I'm wearing hoops today. Things like that are changing the status quo of medicine. We need to. We need to do it for our patients. Patients that receive care from physicians that have cultural understanding or similar cultural background, they do better. We, of course, Latinas cannot cover every Latina patient. We barely make it to 2%. But in order to encourage our trainees, encourage the next generation to stay in academia, we need to create this welcoming environment. We need to be there for them and just embracing who they are. For the Duma Lab, we have a group text uh, that used to be called the Duma Lab, but now it's called Daily Serotonin Group because all members are encouraged to be themselves, to post anything in the group that they consider appropriate or important. And I often read in the text group, find yourself a lab that you can do this. <laughs> like some, you know, funny pictures. This is a article that the members of the lab wrote. I was not aware of the article and how robust and effective membership is important for academic medicine, particularly for underrepresented groups in medicine. This was published as a guest editorial at the Cancer Letter in July 2nd. As we continue to embrace ourselves, we need to make sure that we don't open the door and close it for the next generation. And a very proud Latina, and a proud Latina in medicine and a proud Latina in oncology. Through all of this work, we are the first lab to have a dedicated colon in Medscape. And it's not only Medscape Oncology, it's Medscape, Medscape Global, Oncology Global and Medscape Global. In this column, we discuss important subjects about social justice, about changing the status quo of a woman of color of medicine. 
And as you can see the beginning of this um, column, I mentioned how I often fell as a physician and a scientist, that I, didn't, I don't look like doctors supposed to look. But I never be happier than when I put that yellow dress back on. Because professional, there's no colors are more professional than others. So why being real is so hard? Well, it is hard because you're constantly told by macroaggressions that you should be different. And this comes the reference about cheese. If you eat the same cheese every day, you're gonna get tired, even if it's your favorite cheese. What we need in medicine is a cheese board, like this one, in which we encourage and like the diversity that's present. We don't try to make everyone cheddar. People can be tomatoes, people can be blueberries. And that diversity just brings so much richness to medicine and the care of our patients. A lot of the things that make it hard to be real are based on unconscious bias. Unconscious bias are intrinsic or biases that automatically sort people in certain groups. Latinas are spicy, Latinas are loud. When in fact, um, they may not be true for that individual. And that's what this professionalism, professionalism is sometimes used as a weapon for minority or women. Gender bias is something that we face every day in which we think one gender may be better for a role than another. And this is all largely based in stereotypes that are based on unconscious bias. Oh, you don't wear dresses. You should smile more. And that's one of the good things about the mask. I've been asked less to be a smile more. Oh, women should be caring. If it does not be in you, then you're not being your real self. And it's important to know that this bias is not only men versus women. There's also bias that affects how real you can be for other groups, because we all been taught since very young that this is how doctors look, this is how doctors dress, this is how doctors behave. But who determined that? Well, just based on the majority group for thousands of years. As we talk about the when it, how professionalism has used as a weapon, as often a way in which we put down women and people of color because we don't feel comfortable, we were as different. But your comfort level or my comfort level shouldn't affect the other patient to be their true selves. When we are our true self, we're happier, we work better, we do better. So we need to stop using professionalism as a weapon. We use it, in, we see it in residency interviews. One example of this is natural hair for black women. Who determined that the hair that comes out of your hair is not professional? That's the hair that comes out of your hair, that your head every day. I have curly hair, which is not as um, stereotype compared to black hair. But I often tell, oh, you look so professional with your straight hair. You look so much better. But this is the hair that comes out of my head. Why do I need to change to fit a box that I will never fit? And it's all expenses of the student and it's all expenses of that woman or person of color. You need to change. I know against changing and in favor of improvement, as long as we preserve our roots. Why do we want everybody to look the same? Why do we wanna eat cheddar cheese every day for the rest of our lives? When there's other cheese like goat cheese and manchego, they're delicious. And I use the cheese analogy just to make it practical but we continue to use professionalism as a weapon against major minority groups. It's also hard to be yourself when you get constant reminders that you don't belong. And these are microaggressions. Microaggressions are micro insults, behavioral sometimes, as well as environmental. The majority are automatic and unintentional and are based on unconscious bias. But imagine like if you get a paper cut once a day 
you can live your life. You get a paper cup. But some people, being their true self, get a hundred paper cuts per day. Those paper cuts are the microaggressions. Like, so, no, no, no. Where are you really, really from? Or like this young lady says, why do you sound, sound so white? And something that in minority groups is called call switch and which you have to leave your personality at home to fit in. You have to hold your stories because the majority group doesn't share them. And these microaggressions like happened to me can change behavior in trainees. It can change behavior in younger women. When you're told over and over again that you don't belong, you're gonna start believing it and you're gonna start changing. Not because you want to, just because sometimes it feels like this is the only way out. And it's important that we talk about intersectionality. Why? Because when trying to be real and embrace yourself, there's some groups that are disproportionately affected more. For example, I use, always use myself as an example. I pay many taxes. And trying to be myself and my true self, sometimes I am with no money. So I pay the minority tax on a Latina. I pay the gender tax, supposed to be caring and know the term. And I pay, I pay the age tax, because graduating from medical school very young is not a good thing. So you pay so many taxes, the minority, the gender, the age, and when you get home, you're just exhausted of fighting these little battles, which in fact, I should use that energy to fight cancer, to treat my patients. So some groups are paying more taxes. A member of the LGTB community that happens also to be a black man is often told not to be themselves. So how can you find your own voice? Well, ask yourself if that is something I really love doing. How can I love keep doing that? Find out why you spend hours reading about it. We help you find your own voice. Like I found myself reading about social justice. That's what motivated me to work on Sunday mornings. As around, as around people that you see that are their true selves and see how, what possibilities are out there. Give it a try or why you think it may not be professional. Sometimes we overthink it and people don't care, in all honesty. One day I was very worried about wearing yellow and purple and nobody cared. And never keep trying because losing who you are or hiding who you are is more detrimental to you than to anybody else. I think Finding your voice and embracing your true self needs to come within you and something that you're passionate. If it is you're not truly passionate about something, people will notice that. So five things to remember how to find your voice. Value your uniqueness. I have a Spanish accent. I used to be very insecure about it. Now I'm like, I'm going to be 80 and I'm still going to sound like this. This is a good thing. You have the power of helping the people around you. It can be above you, same level, it can be trainees. Make sure you find people that are struggling. So they're okay. They know there's okay to be who they are. If you're quiet or silent, you're also an accomplice or when we're trying to weaponize professionalism. If somebody makes a comment about somebody's hair, which is irrelevant, you can be there to stop that. Imposter syndrome is a reality and does affect being your true self because you feel like you're no deserving. Do you receive an award? I do it all the time. And I'm like, well, I'm very sure somebody was more deserving than this than me. I have accepted awards that way probably way too many times. Saying that there were people that were more deserving than me. And that imposter syndrome sometimes makes you like seclude yourself and not embrace who you are. Finally, be willing to listen as much as you want it to be listened. Because you don't want to be yourself, but you're preventing others from being their true self. 
find your voice and stay behind it. Because who wants to be average? You, everyone has something to bring to the table. Many of us are part of very small groups and we're here to change the status quo. My hope is that nobody or less number of people need to go through these years of suffering like I did when I finally realized this is what it is. I'm a Latina, I have this accent and I'm gonna be who I am. And it's ironic how many medical students stop me and are Dr. Duma, we just love for who you are. And I never thought I would hear that. I joke about it. I play Cardi B in my lectures because that's who I am and I'm free. And now I can spend more time in my research but trying to be somebody else. Finally, I think it's very important that you find your wolf back, your friends, your group. There are many steps to find your wolf pack. First, find out who you want to, which wolf pack you want to be part of. When I talk about wolf pack, it's a group that you work with, that you share with, or your friends out of work. Sometimes you need to put yourself in places where you meet potential allies. Go to that event that you never go because you know you never know if you'll find your wolf back there. Ask real questions to other women or men part of your wolf back. Like I used to, I asked a friend, I was like, do people comment on your hair all the time? Do people ask to touch your hair? And my friend's like, no, you never ask anybody. I was like, why that happens to me every week? You are no alone feeling lonely or feeling that you cannot be yourself. There's other people out there and a stronger, we're stronger together. And finally, sometimes you need to look outside of your institution. Be so good that they can't ignore you. I'm not gonna repeat that. Be so good that they can't ignore you. And finally, give yourself some grace. We are going through a very stressful time. This pandemic has lasted longer than anybody expected. We have spent years now without seeing family. So if the one day you just don't want to fight, you just want to wear scrubs and a ponytail, that's fine. And if you want to wear that every day, that's also good. Be who you want to be. Give yourself grace to order food one day and not trying to be a superwoman every day because that is also exhausting. Hey, and if you hiring a cleaning lady is an auction, that's how I give myself grace. And thank you for your time um, and for the invitation to share my journey and a few tips with you. Thank you.